All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for the invitation to chat with all of you. Um, I, I'm a professor in the Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics. Uh, I'm a plant biochemist uh, by training, but have had the opportunity at the University of Minnesota to be involved in a wide range of things over my 48 year career. Uh, starting out working with the grass seed industry, and I won't go into any details, but the whole idea behind Forevergreen came out of my, my work that I've been engaged in in Rosso and Lake of the Woods County is in the northern part of Minnesota. That group of community leaders brought me to Minnesota in 1974 to figure out how to put perennial crops on the landscape with an economic pull. And I was successful in building the grass seed industry in northern Minnesota. I won't give you the details, but that's really where this idea comes from. If you want to uh, have um, uh, a landscape that is producing ecosystem services, and you want farmers to produce those crops that produce those services, uh, there has to be an economic opportunity for the farmers to do that, or it just isn't going to happen. Um, so we are developing uh, here at the University of Minnesota within the Forever Green Initiative from my vantage point, we're developing the next generation of crops. And I think most of you that have a connection to the land grants and agriculture in general know that all of the crops that are currently on the landscape in the Midwest all came from uh, the public investment in the land grants to produce hybrid corn, soybeans, wheat, oat, and barley, and on and on, right? And that was picked up then by, by the industry over time. But all of the original development of these crops occurred within the land grant universities. So this program is just a continuation of that. And we've just had this long gap between introduction of soybeans and the, the, the development of these new forever green forever green crops. So what we're talking about uh, basically is mainstream for us. Um, it's developing a new set of crops, but is not outside of the framework of what uh, colleges of agriculture, departments of agronomy and plant genetics have been, been doing for well over 120 years, right? So it's a continuation of that. So just to get right at it. So the Forever Green Agriculture Initiative is designed uh, to focus on the development of winter annual and perennial crops. Most everything that we've done in, at the University of Minnesota in the past uh, in terms of agriculture crops have been focused on summer annuals, corn, soybeans, wheat, barley, you know, you know the game, right? Um, but we're focused on winter annuals, things that you can plant in the fall uh, they grow in the fall, cover the land, cover the land in the spring. Um, and also then perennial crops that provide that continuous living, continuous living cover year after year after year. Um, like alfalfa, right? You know, in terms of a short term, a perennial uh, alfalfa on the landscape for four to five, four to five years. Those are the type of perennials that we're trying to get out on the landscape to produce that cover. Uh, protect, protect the soil and provide um, protection of the water supply, the water quality. But also, just to, re, just to say it again, uh, these crops are being developed uh, to make sure that we get those services, but also provide opportunities for farmers and rural communities while protecting the soil and water resources, right? That's the game. That's the idea behind it all. <clears throat> so uh, we're developing new uh, new food products. You just one was just held up there <laughs> as an advertisement. Uh, that is a, a cereal that's developed off of uh, our release of the first perennial grain in the world. That's Kernza. <clears throat> it's an intermediate wheatgrass, and I'll say a little bit um, more about that. But that's the general idea, you know, all the way from basic genomics, breeding, agronomics, to that grain in that damn box. Right? That's the idea. So providing new economic opportunities for farmers, but also for rural communities. Most of you know that over the last 50 years, there, has, there isn't an awful lot of value added 
uh, to the agriculture systems in the, in the Midwest. Basically, a lot of farmers are producing a raw product, corn and soybeans, and many of them do not, no longer have the opportunity to add value through livestock. That grain product goes to a feedlot where the value is added. So that has been, been lost as part of the agriculture system in the Midwest. We want to bring back some of that in the context of the release of some of these new crops. And then the ecosystem services, potential carbon sequestration, increasing soil health, protecting that, uh, that soil resource and, and, and the water resources associated with the agricultural systems, right? So this allows me to kind of lay out the issue that we're facing. You know, most of the Midwest, we're looking at corn and soybeans on millions of acres of the, of the landscape. These are crops that are highly productive, but they're only on the landscape for a very short period of, of time, leaving the soil exposed for extended periods. And I just wanna show you a picture. These are satellite shots of chlorophyll on the landscape starting <clears throat> in April. <clears throat> you can see the corn belt, right? From Minnesota, look how brown Minnesota is all the way over to Ohio in April. Uh, here we are in May. This is the way the landscape, landscape across the Midwest looks today. Maybe even a little browner this year <laughs> because of the late season. Uh, basically that soil, the water that's there is going down. Uh, there's no use of the water or the solar radiation uh, at this time across the major portion of the region. And then we get into about the middle of June and you can see that the soil is just starting to be covered. In July, we're doing really well. We're really fixing a lot of carbon, <laughs> holding a lot of water in place, using a lot of the nutrients in the, in, the, in the system. But by September 15th, October 1st, you can see that brown period again. And I always ask every group I talk to, let's just review the number of months that we have green cover roots, active roots in the soil. July, August, and maybe through September. Only three of the 12 months, only three of the 12 months do we actually have living roots in that soil, providing a cover for that soil, using water out of that system and holding nutrients on that landscape, right? When I first looked at this, basically looking at these, basically for me, this describes a problem <laughs> that we're facing or the opportunity that we're facing, right, in terms of uh, opportunity to protect the water supply, fix more carbon for a longer period of time during the during the growing season. So these are just the examples um, uh, taken on the St. Paul campus. Uh, the, these were taken the same day, side by side. This is um, uh, soil that was tilled in the fall following a, a, a uh, an inch rainfall. Then on your, on your right, that's Kernza. That's the perennial grass that is in that, um, that cereal box that, uh, that Greg just showed you. Obviously there's less erosion, less phosphorus loss, less nitrogen leach leaching, and provides the opportunity for wellhead protection um, and planting and buffer strips across the, the, the region. And then below, that, the top one is our perennial example. And then below, uh, here's what land it looks like today that's being prepared for planting of, a, uh, uh, of an annual crop like corn and soybeans as compared to a winter annual that was planted in the fall, established in the fall, and this is the type of growth that you have by mid-April in the spring, right? The idea is it's holding the soil in place, it's using water, rather than sending it down to the Gulf of Mexico, and it's holding nitrate and hydrogen in, in place, all right? So these are examples of systems that give you ecosystem services, but they also provide new economic opportunities for farmers, right? That's the economic pull. You can develop all the new crops you want, you want but if it doesn't have an economic return to the farmer, to the community, it's just not going to happen. So that's our game, right? All the way from basic genomics 
to commercialization, to get these new crops on the landscape to produce those ecosystem services, along with a new set of economic opportunities. So if you're going to have economic opportunity, there has to be something coming out of these crops that has value in the marketplace. So we're developing new unique food feed. And that box he just held up is an example of unique in use. The first perennial grain in the world in that box sold by General Mills and Cascadian Farms. Right? So also energy production in terms of the oil seeds that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, oil seed for human, con human consumption as well as for, for jet fuel. All right, so this is just again a list of summary of what I've just basically said. New economic opportunities, high value food, feed and energy ingredients for the energy sector as well as the food sector. And that damn box you held up is an example of that. Green marketing in the interest of green um, uh, land, uh, uh, green uh, marketing opportunities is of great value to General Mills and companies, PepsiCo, that they can market something to a consumer that basically says, if you buy this, you're producing ecosystem services, reducing greenhouse gases, carbon, sequestering carbon, and those types of uh, those types of things. It's also producing innovative, healthy food um, uh, uh, products uh, in the in the market. And for me, as a rural kid, that's managed the family farm in Northwest Ohio up until four years ago. The reason I'm in Minnesota is because there was no economic opportunity for a young kid like me in the 1970s. I had to go off and did not have the opportunity to re return back to my community. So I'm very interested in developing these crops along with the new opportunities for not only farmers, but for value add in the, in, the, in the rural communities. We'll talk more about that if we have time later on. So these are the ecosystem services. I just sent out a picture of our pennycress and, and camelina that's now in full bloom, full bloom on the St. Paul campus, just loaded with bees, right? So, these early season crops are providing uh, nectar and pollen for a wide range of pollinators. At the same time, protecting the water supply, managing the nutrients and all of you that are part of the agriculture conversation know that nitrate nitrogen leaches, right? If you don't have roots in the soil and the water is moving, nitrate is gonna move right along with it. But if you have roots there, taking it up like I showed you earlier, keeps that nitrogen in place and keeps it out of our rivers and streams and out of the Gulf of Mexico, right? And we are evaluating the systems to determine whether or not they do in fact sequester carbon. That's a large part of our program uh, to determine whether these systems sequester carbon and if they do what level uh, 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 is occurring. So protection, protect that niche, Natural resource base. If we don't have that, uh, we have uh, a real problem for, uh, for for future generations. It's all fine and dandy, <clears throat> but how do you make it happen? So within the land grants, like the University of Minnesota, I like to call you land grant universities full service universities. We have everything. Everything is in place to do big things, right? For example, we have world-class plant breeders. We have world-class genomicists already in place. We have agronomists, we had food scientists, we have the Carlson School of Management. All of the pieces to put the entire basic genetics, genomics, breeding, agronomics, assessment ecosystem services all the way through to early stage production and supply chain and market development are, are already in place. So what I have done over the last 30 years is put 16 new crop development platforms together that include all of these components. 
right? I'm a scientist, but I'm also an organizer, right? Basically put together 16, in reality, small companies, utilizing the resources within the land grant to do the basic science, do these protection agronomy, and then taking it into the food science team here at the University of Minnesota, and then in partnership with Carlson School uh, to, to, to develop the supply chain development in partnership with industry, right? And new forms of, um, of, of industry we can, we, that I'll come back to a little bit later. But this is, this is what Forever Green is. This is what we do. The basic genomics through supply chain development for these new crops. <clears throat> so here's the list of crops. So this is basically my contribution over the last 30 years to put these teams together. We have the, the perennial crops and the Kernza that was in the box that, was, that Greg just held up. That's intermediate wheatgrass. It's the first perennial grain in the world. Something that you can plant in the fall and harvest for at least four to five years, right? And we'll talk a little bit about this example a little bit later on. We also have perennial sunflower that's, the, that's getting ready for commercialization. Perennial flax, cur, clover, silphium. It's a cousin of, of sunflower that's uh, getting close to release. And then you guys all know about alfalfa. Alfalfa feeding the cows. Our work is designed to feed alfalfa, the protein directly to human beings. Right. Rather than running alfalfa through livestock, we're de developing alfalfa for direct human consumption, right? To increase, to increase the, the market demand for that crop that we want to have on the landscape, right? And then a perennial cereal rye um, that I just looked at yesterday, it looks outstanding on the St. Paul campus. It overwintered and looks really, really nice. And then the the winter annuals. Now the winter annuals are designed to fit within the corn and soybean rotation. Remember the brown? That brown basically reflects the brown that's being left at the tails of the corn and soybean rotation, right? As most of you know, uh, a large portion of Minnesota, we haven't moved a wheel yet. So it's still brown. We don't even have seed in the ground yet. So our green cover won't occur until the latter part of uh, latter part of June. It has been raining, tiles are running, nitrate nitrogen is moving through the system. If we have these winter annuals, the winter annuals are now blooming out there on campus. You know, they're eight to 10 inches high already compared to bare ground where you're getting ready to plant corn and soybeans. But we then relay crop soybeans and corn into that system, right? So it gives you that continuous living cover. So it's a cover crop with economic value, right? That's what we try to uh, uh, say about these, these winter annual cover crops. And I'll show you what that looks like in a few minutes. Winter barley, hairy vetch. And then we have native woodies. The big one that's breaking through that you can now purchase online is hazelnuts produced here in the Midwest. Um, the Northern hazelnut growers uh, are already have products in the market and that, um, that production is expanding very, very rapidly. Elderberry, I won't say much about, but this I think gives you the idea. So the program is broken up into three different types of crops under development, the perennial crops, the winter annuals, and then the perennial uh, uh, woody plants. So we've had some success. And here's the box in the middle that uh, Greg just held up, uh, but that's not the only one. There's a wide range of other products from crackers to beer, to Patagonia pasta, um, the whole grain uh, uh, Kernza um, uh, in the marketplace, as well as a wide range of restaurants uh, using uh, these grains um, uh, today in, in, a wide range of, in a wide range of products. So this is what I like to show here, right? The forever green crops from research, basic science to the field, to the table. That's what we do in forever green. 
Okay. We don't just do a piece of it. We do it all. And we do it all in unison. All right. As it's time to develop the markets, as the new crops come along, we develop the, the supply chain and market that matches uh, the markets that have that have developed as we move as we move forward. So I'll just, just look at the products that we've developed over the last number of years. And this basically is a slide that I've developed uh, to show the legislators. We've released the Clearwater Kernza. Uh, that was, was in the box that Greg showed you. We released winter barley varieties, winter hardy hairy vetch, 16 hazelnut lines. We have a short season winter camelina and we've domesticated pentacress. Uh, so these are just some of the outcomes over the last uh, few years, but the initial work goes back 25 years. We're now going commercial with these, that long-term investment. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to give you just a couple of examples, right? So you can actually see what's, what's happening. So I'm gonna give you one example in terms of a perennial crop, and that's the one we just referred to. That's intermediate wheatgrass, Kernza. And then I'll show you the two examples of the winter annual crops that fit in the corn and soybean rotation, <clears throat> Pentacress and, um, and Camelina, if that's okay. I... So let's start out with <clears throat> intermediate wheatgrass. Intermediate wheatgrass was introduced in the United States you know, over 100 years ago from the Caucasus regions of Russia. And it was introduced in the United States as a forage crop. So just to make a long story really short, we are domesticating intermediate wheatgrass as a perennial grain, but it also is dual use. You can also graze it and you can harvest the grain for, uh, for milling into the products that Greg just showed you earlier. And the enterprise is being developed, beer, whiskey is being made off of it. A wide range of food products can also be used as biomass and also can be, uh, be grazed. This is why we like it. That is the root system of intermediate wheatgrass. Compared to uh, winter wheat, right? That root system developed in one year. So that would be planted in the fall. And that's the root system that is developed by the next fall, All right? So it gives you a lot of things to think about, right? That's why the folks that are in, in the duismas that are looking at wellhead protection, they want this grass as a new commercial product <laughs> that they can plant in the duismas and the wellhead protection regions and we now have evidence that no nitrogen goes through that system, but not only that, but it appears they can actually bring nitrogen that has gone down back up, All right? Nothing down, but it can also bring nitrogen up, back up through the, through, through the system and improve the quality of the water in our rural uh, communities water supply systems, All right? So just remember that route. So the attributes, the reason we picked it to go forward with, it, it, it had relatively large seeds to start with before we started. So we're increasing the seed size. It has a lot of biomass and at harvest, it's a stay green crop. It dries from top down. So when you harvest uh, the stems and the leaves below it, it has 15% protein. The protein is ideal for dry dairy cattle. Right, so it has that value as well. As a high level of disease resistance, you don't see any major issues with diseases. It can be grazed. And the idea, again, idea for wellhead protection. And we got lucky. The damn thing tastes good. <laughs> it doesn't have any off flavors. So it can immediately uh, go directly into, into, the, into, into the food system. And it has high protein, 
you know, uh, I think a lot of you know that wheat uh, protein levels about 13 to 14, Kearns is 24, 24% protein. So it's a very high protein grain. And it has a unique, unique, unique flavor, little nutty flavor that uh, people really, really like. So breeding. So the breeding is done in concert with Dr. Pam Ismail and George Anar. These are the food scientists. So it's this link between the breeding and the food scientists to bring along the grain that meets the market demand. Things that have utility to PepsiCo, General Mills, Kellogg, the small brewers, the large brewers, pasta makers, right? So it's that link between the breeding effort and the food scientists. And these are our ties to the, in, the food industry, right? Through uh, Pam Ismail and George. So we're breeding for higher yield, yield longevity in terms of uh, maintaining yields over time, seed size, shadow resistance, uh, lodging resistance, basically looking at domestication traits um, and that's really what it's all about, domesticating these new, new crops, getting, reducing shatter, dormancy, and all of those things. And the pictures there is on the St. Paul campus. This is the nursery, so you drive by the St. Paul campus. This is what you're going to see sometimes. The current nursery, those of you that are local, the nursery is on the northeast corner of Cleveland and Larpenter. So if you go by and you want to keep an eye on it, feel free to do so. So here's what we're doing. And this is the progress. Obviously, uh, when you domesticate a new crop, the first thing you wanna do is keep it from shattering. You don't want all weedy nat native species drop their seeds as early as possible, right? <laughs> but if you want it to be a crop, you have to reduce that shatter. So it stays on the plant long enough that you can come in and harvest it. We're also uh, 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 developing Hullless grain, so you don't have to take through that last step to dehull the grain. And then you get an idea over here on the right. Uh, you see number eight is wheat as, in comparison to uh, the new lines of kerns. It's about half the size in terms of weight of, of, of wheat. But you can see the line at the bottom and in the breeding program, we're rapidly increasing the size of the seed in the breeding program. So all those lines show improvement in the breeding program over, over time. So uh, this was our big deal. This is the grain that was in the box that Greg held up. We released uh, our first line of, of intermediate wheatgrass. The release was called Minnesota Clearwater. We're naming all of these things after water bodies in the state of Minnesota, because that's really what we're, we're designed to do, protect the soil and water resources of Minnesota and beyond, All right? So agronomics, obviously you have to do the standard agronomic things, nitrogen rates, row spacing, harvesting time, grazing, legume, intercropping, and uh, yield uh, persistence over time. So a big investment in that area, but also a big investment in ecosystem services, including greenhouse gases out of these systems, as well as I'm showing you here, just one example in terms of nitrate leaching. Look at the top bar or top line, that's corn. And that's looking at the soil water nitrate level below, uh, uh, below the, the, the roots. Um, compared to switchgrass, a number of you guys know that native, that's a native, uh, prairie grass in, in this region. It's a warm season grass and you can see that it still loses nitrogen because it's a warm season grass and it doesn't start growing until the end of June, right? So nitrogen even moves through there as comparison to Kernza, the lower line, basically nothing moves through that system. When you put on nitrogen, and this experiment shows differences in rates, but even when you have the same amount of nitrogen, 120 to 160 pounds of nitrogen on switchgrass, 
no nitrogen moves through it. It's all held in place. It's all used, right? Complete efficiency in, in, nit in nitrogen use as compared to corn is 50. The nitrogen you put on corn, 50% of that nitrogen is lost and is not taken up and used in the production of the stover or the grain, right? As compared to Kernza, which is, you know, 90, 95% efficient. Our production systems, we're focusing on regions of the state where the, well where the wells are contaminated. So that's the place we're developing our first commercial production, central sand plains of Minnesota, southwest and southeast Minnesota. So that's where the production at, and that's where the production and storage of the grain is, is occurring, and then making it available to the, to, to the end users. So again, a wide range of products uh, being developed off of Kernza or enemy wheatgrass, uh, looking at the gluten composition, where we're looking at digestibility of the gluten, uh, storage and flavor profiles. So the standard basic food science work and it has been done in partnership with the, the major food companies. All right, so I'm gonna leave you with that, right? So that's an example of a, 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 perennial, a, a perennial grain uh, coming out of the program. And then we can talk about pentacrest and camelina. And I note that I'm running a little late already. How does that happen? Uh, so let me just say a couple more words about this is to, to give you the idea. So you guys are done at noon, right? All right. So I'll do this real fast just to give you the idea. So Pentecrest, Camelina, these are cool season, winter hardy, winter hardy oilseed crafts. We've never lost a plant here in Minnesota. And that obviously is the first green. If you want a winter annual in Minnesota, it has to be winter hardy. So these are winter, really winter hardy uh, oilseed oil seed crafts. So in the breeding program, we are domesticating Pentecrest. Pentecrest is a weed that most of you know. We are domesticating Pentecrest the same way that the Canadians domesticated rapeseed that you now know as canola. We're doing exactly the same thing with Pentecrest and we have domesticated it in six years and it took the Canadians three decades because we have new genomic tools that allow us to do it much, um, much, much faster. So I'll just show you the system. So we seed on the left, we seed the Pentecrest or Camelina uh, into, the, into the corn. And then the next spring we come back and plant soybeans and you can see the row of soybeans uh, in the field where the combine is going through. Uh, we, we harvest the Pentecrest and Camelina over top of the soybeans so you get that continuous living green cover. So this is really what it looks like. Establish the oil seed in the fall, come back in April and plant soybeans, no tilling it, they grow together. You harvest um, uh, the pentacrest in the first two weeks in June uh, over top of the, uh, of the soybeans and then the soybean gets released. So you get the two crops. And when you grow these two together, the over yield per unit, the yield per unit area goes up between 20 and 30%. So it has an overall yield increase when you combine the, the Pentecrest Camelina and the, and, the, and the soybeans, right? So this is the idea. Skip row, you see the soybeans at the bottom of the arrows, giving it space to grow in the crops and harvest it over the top. And I'll leave you with this and I'll stop. Again, carbon sequestration, protection of water from nitrate nitrogen. This is the nitrate nitrogen at 30 and 60 centimeters below the, in the, in the soil. No-till, this is the amount that's being lost compared to radish as a cover crop, compared to winter rye, and all of you know that winter rye survives the winter. Pentecrest and camelina is in fact is good in protecting 
the water supply from nitrate leaching, as is winter rye, plus it provides an economic return to the farmer. Okay. Whereas if you don't graze winter rye, you're not getting an economic value. Whereas these two crop, new crops, spinacrass and camelina, uh, provide a new economic opportunity as well as protecting the, 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 the water supply. And I'll just show you one more thing. There's this ecological principle. If you get there first, you win. Look at camelina in your lower right side. That's camelina with no herbicide applied. As compared to a weedy check next to it. That's the level of weed management these systems give. Basically reducing the use of, of, of Roundup by at least 80%. There may be some years that you have to apply Roundup, but it, it's a, a way of dramatically reducing uh, herbicides input for weed management and basically a new tool for controlling weeds in the corn and soybean rotation. All right. I'd love to go on, but I'm going to stop and uh, and uh, we'll open it up for comments and, uh, and questions if you have any. And you have a bunch of questions here in the chat function. <laughs> oh, my um, God. No. So just to let you know, I'm going to call on some people here. I'm going to start at the top. I've been taking notes. All right. And if folks can speak up, that would be great. If not, I will try to Par paraphrase the question if it's longer. So Sarah, you were the first one with a question. If you can come off mute from your iPhone. Um, hi, I think the question's just pretty clear. Are these crops genetically engineered? They are not, uh, but I'm not against it. Well, I'm uh, not thinking that. I just want to know. No, they, 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 are, they are not. So that's a big dang debate, right? So, so why aren't they? It's basically because the food companies say don't, right? They're basically saying at this stage, um, as you move these, these new crops into the marketplace, if you can do the same thing with natural variation, do it. Right. And that's what we have not we have not had any setbacks or any delays because we've been able to find natural mutations in the populations. And we have not had a reason to 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 use CRISPR or any other technology, but we do use it in our laboratory. As a double check, we can do a knockout of, of, of a gene to see whether or not that what we have actually caught captured naturally uh, is appropriate gene. Okay. Stephen, you, you want to ask a couple of your questions? You've been queuing up here. You're on mute, I think. You hear me now? We do. Yes. Okay. There's something wrong with the headset. Um, I asked you about the ability of Kernzit to scavenge nitrogen, but uh, Professor Weiss, pretty much uh, after that question was put in, he uh, very much has dealt with that. Uh, I wanted to know how it compared to winter rye, and it sounds that, as if it's uh, be better as a scavenger. Oh, by far and away. It's the yeah. most, you know, I've been doing this for years, and, 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 you know, I can look, the, our data suggests that really what I just said, no nitrogen moves to that dang system at all. Not only that, not only that, but even more exciting is that it appears that it can bring it back up. So the next big step in working with groups like PepsiCo, you know, that sell lay potato chips, they're very interested in working Kernza into the potato, potato rotation with Kernza in between. Right, so in the sand plane, you know, they're putting on 300 to 400 pounds of nitrogen. Some of that goes down, right? No question. But if you could come in the fall after potato harvest and plant Kernza and have that root system developed by the next 
next fall, we're asking the question, can that nitrogen that is being left by the potato be brought back up and support the Kernza and, and, and clean up the water supply? I had also asked a couple of years ago, I heard that General Mills was about to put a Kernza breakfast cereal on the market in a box uh, and then they pulled back. I wondered what happened and how the the situation was remedied so that they're now uh, ready for commerce. Well, I can tell you exactly what happened. They jumped the gun. They didn't do the due diligence. They didn't, let's put it this way. They didn't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> when you introduce a new crop, and you're putting it out to farmers for the first time, you have to have consultants that are working directly with those farmers, right? So there was no information that went out in terms of how to produce it, you know, how to plant it, how to manage weeds, how to harvest it, how to dry it, how to store it. And uh, it was just a huge bust. They should, have, they should have known better. So that's what happened, right? So the box that, the box that uh, Greg just showed is a second run done correctly. Our teams are out there working with the farmers. The Forever Green team works directly with the, with the farmers, uh, helps them get it planted all the way through processing it, uh, cleaning it, checking it for uh, 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 quality issues, uh, storing it, and making it available then to, to, to the companies. It was just it was just a failed rollout. Not enough information in the in, in the system, and I'll just That's say good one to know. Thank just you. One, I'll just tell you one more time. I, they did they did not listen to us. That no. I, I have a friend in Ontario who wants to grow kerns, and I'll put him in touch with with you. Can, you, <clears> can <throat> we get your uh, email in the in the chat? Or I know you showed it earlier. I can share that. Okay, thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but, but I, this is what I would say back to you. What we're trying to do, in the, I maybe didn't make the point big enough. What we're trying to concentrate production. We don't want production scattered all over North America. We want it concentrated because you have to build capacity all the way to educating the farmers, all the way through the production practices, all the way through the drying and storage capacity, uh, as well as then connecting it to the, to the end users. So we are really reluctant to, to just send seed out willy nilly you know, across the, the, the country. Um, Patagonia is coordinating the production in Europe. Um, and so we're working with groups like that that have the capacity to invest to invest the resources in it to actually support the farmers and the and the supply chain that needs to be developed to make it happen. So let me get to Reed has a few questions and then we'll get to Claus here next. So Reed, if you want to ask one or two of your questions. Sure. Uh, one of the, the first one I think was um, about whether the silphium and the perennial flax and uh, perennial rye are ready for distribution for planting? Uh, or they're close. Uh, we're in that early stage of developing the infrastructure to make that happen. The perennial uh, flax is going to be rolled out as an ornamental first. It's a beautiful plant. We have lines that can be planted uh, first off as hedges in people's backyards to, to provide nectar and pollen for, uh, for pollinators, right? The next phase will be rolling it, rolling it out for oil and protein, and then out for fiber. So for oil and protein, we're probably four years out, five years out. So the new lines are being evaluated across uh, the state and region. And, and we're still in the process of, since these are perennials, it takes time to know how long they will persist. And I want to know, have some idea of that before I release. I want to know 
I want to know whether they are truly winter hardy. And there's variation yet in some of our lines. So before we release them, I want to make sure we know where we're at in, in, in winter hardiness and, 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 and longer term performance. Right. Okay. That it makes sense. I just wonder. Oh, and what was, was the other one? So that's flat. What was the other one you asked about? Silphium is further out. Uh, Silph, silphium, uh, silflower is still, that's probably maybe eight years out. Um, they're making great progress, but you know, that, that is going from just a plant that has had absolutely no domestication, zero, so it's going to take a little bit longer with uh, with with, with Sylvia and the team is making great progress, uh, but that's a, probably a little bit further out. We're just now starting to do the feed science, feed science, food science research on on the composition of the new lines of uh, of Sylvia. So we're that's a little further out. What was the other one? Uh, there was the flax. Flax, rye, silphium, those are the three I asked about. The perennial, the, 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 the perennial cereal rye, uh, we're just in the process of evaluating the water, the, the winter hardiness of the material. And I just visited those plots yesterday. Uh, really exciting. Um, almost all the lines that are in the breeding program came through this winter on scave. So this was a really a good test winter. You know, the snow is gone and we got, you know, some low temperatures. So uh, I'm feeling really good about the, the perennial cereal, not winter, you know, not winter rye. This is perennial cereal rye uh, that um, uh, I think the breeding team has made really good uh, progress in winter, selecting for winter hardiness. Those are, you know, I would say probably five years, you know. But there'll be, you know, right. on farm trials, seed increases. Uh, that will be occurring, you know, uh, but probably within the next three. Okay, I'll I'll yield to somebody else's question yep. since we have limited. Thank you, and Claus, and then Sue Susan. Yeah, thank you, Don. This was uh, uh, really a wonderful presentation here, and I would love to have a copy of your PowerPoint if you're willing to share. Well, I have a bigger one. That I I have a bigger one. This is just pretty limited. Oh my. I have another one. I have another one. If, yeah, you know, I can share this one, but if you want the more comprehensive one, I'd be happy sure. to see you guys. So, so we have been developing a series of webinars. We just had our fifth webinar that was focused on funding sources for uh, transitioning farmers uh, into regenerative practices. Yeah. The idea of stacked funding sources or aggregated yeah. funding, you know. Yeah. So we, we are planning for our next uh, webinar to focus on supply chain linkages because yeah, yeah. without the supply chain engaging at scale, yeah. you know, the transition will be will be slow. So you already wrote half of our of our next webinar. Here. Well, we're, we're right in the middle of it, and and I'll just say, uh, do you guys know Lucas Walton? Uh, yeah. The Walton family. Yeah, you know him. I don't know him personally, but I know of him. Well, well, you know, we had been working with the Walton Family Foundation, and Lucas learned about this work probably six years ago, and he flew in to meet with us and listen to our whole whole story, and uh, we were just in the in the process of moving directly, you know, towards commercialization. And he, he basically came in and gave us that lecture that you need more infrastructure and commercialization. And he stepped to the plate. So um, help fund. We now have five people that are working on supply chain for these uh, and market development for these crops. So we have some really, really great people uh, yeah, working, I mean, on, working on uh, supply chains for regenerative systems and include these crops. Yeah, it would be. It would be uh, helpful to educate you know, uh, more, more people who are not necessarily directly linked into, into farming and agriculture on what are the complexities. Uh, in, I mean, when you talk about supply chain, what do you need in terms of transportation equipment, silos, and yeah, so on? Everyone so uses the equipment. game. Everyone wants to just go out and plant something. Yeah. Well, that's what General Mills did. They took kerns and they went out and planted something, and it failed. Right. right. So there's, as you guys, you know, 
it's a it it takes a strategic plan uh, to move things and everything has to move in unison. You can't develop a market if you can't supply the market, right? Right. <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's a really interesting, and we have great people that are working on each of these sixteen platforms and matching that all up, matching up production. Uh, along with the development of the markets and the supply chain. The, the important part really is that the legislative process has to be informed because that's where the funding is being allocated and the farm bill and, and other uh, the funding. Uh, yeah, uh, our, uh, we, we are very, very proud of our state government and their billing. We, those of you that are not Minnesotans, we have what is called the uh, Clean Water Legacy Program that 10 years ago, the citizens of the state of Minnesota decided to put, what was it, three quarters of a cent in the, in the sales tax into this legacy program. And it and, and now contains millions of dollars. And um, we went able to, to tap some of those resources that gave us this base funding to move this program forward and position us to bring in major Foundation dollars, federal dollars, and and from uh, uh, rich people <laughs> like Lucas, right? So that's that model of funding that we've been able to bring together with money that goes directly to farmers. And my, I, as a farm kid, I don't think any of these farmers that are coming in and starting off and uh, developing the base knowledge that can be used by others. I don't want those farmers to take all of the risk. They need to be supported as they get involved in developing these new systems, uh, that they're not putting uh, their, their financial uh, uh, existence at, at risk. And we've been able uh, to convince um, our legislators uh, to, 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 su to support that, that idea. Great story to share, thank you. Yeah. So we, we simply had more questions than time. There, there is one <laughs> this with- this is, what, this is what I would say to you guys. I, I can stay on. I don't have another meeting until two. If you guys want to stay on, I'd be happy to stay on if anybody wants to stay on. Where's our leader, Nancy, here? Yeah. So, so basically, those of you who want or need to leave um, can do so. Um, but otherwise, sure, we'll take you up on that. Thank you. No, I'm, not, no, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely, you, you know, I love to talk to people about this. <laughs> Uh, because uh, this is unique in the country. It's the only program like this, and I want as many people to know about it. We just got um, a piece in uh, the New York Times, so we're getting a lot of attention from around the world, so I'd be happy to, uh, to continue the conversation. And, and Dr. Wise, a couple of people asked a question about the relationship of your work to another group called the Land Institute. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I, I personally in the program has been working in the Land Institute for 35, 40 years. And, and just to give you an idea of the link, you know, we have this, you know, the other thing that we don't talk about, you know, this, I represent an academic institution. What do we do? Well, here's an example of products that we produce, but what the hell's the other product? People. <laughs> so the, the, Kearns of Breeder at the Land Institute uh, is my PhD student of 22 years ago, Lee DeHaan, right? So, you know, a lot of people don't make that connection, but a lot of the folks that are out there in the world working on these crops and cropping systems came out of the Forever Green Initiative that are now scattered across the country. And a lot of the people also came out of the Land Institute. You know, they would bring in kids from across the country and around the world to work at the Land Institute in summer programs. Uh, they went off and got their uh, degrees in plant breeding, genomics and food science. So this is another uh, product that comes out of the Land Institute and the University of Minnesota and other universities uh, that are actively engaged in this work. So we have a strong, strong working relationship with that NGO, the Land, the, the Land Institute. And they now are becoming a substantial scientific NGO. They have some great, great plant breeders 
They're as good as any academic plant breeders, in some cases even better. So they are great partners in, in the uh, advancement of, uh, of these new, new crops. But we are different than them, right? The Land Institute only focuses on perennials. We focus on anything that's gonna give you a continuous living cover, right? So they do not work on winter annuals. They don't work on any woodies, right? So, so we are broader in scope than the, the, and the, than the Land Institute. They basically just focus on, on perennials. I want, that's, that's, a, that's a long shot. That's out there a ways, right? We need things like pennycress <laughs> that I'm showing you here in this slide that's still up. We need immediate help in the corn and soybean rotation, right? Corn and soybeans are gonna be with us forever. We need to figure out how to fill that brown and to make that system um, uh, more sustainable <clears throat> with an economic pull. Not wagging the finger at the farmer, give them tools to accomplish these goals that we want, we want on, from the landscape. Good. So Susan and then Nancy. Susan had a couple of questions. You can come off a of mute. Not seeing her come off a of mute. So Nancy, you you want to you 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 had several questions, Nancy. <laughs> so you get to pick your. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so um, I had heard quite a long time ago that Kernza had about thirteen percent grain yield. Um, what do you mean by grain? What, what do you mean by grain yield percent? Grain yield. Um, I think compared to um, regular wheat. Oh, oh, regular wheat, yeah. yeah. So it's about, uh, so the yields of the new lines yield about a thousand pounds uh, per acre. But remember, this is for our program, that's, that's after six, seven years of breeding. Hmm. Mm -hmm. right? We are doing really well. In each cycle, we're going up uh, in the range of five to eight percent in yield. So, to, so we've calculated it out. We we are now doing two cycles a year. Uh, the projections are that we will have yields of Kernza in that system that are equivalent to to uh, to wheat in seventeen years. Mm, wow! Right? Yeah, wow. That's right. It's really really exciting. Uh, but that's that's the game, right? Yeah. And just to remind people that when the University of Minnesota released its first soybean varieties, do you know what the first soybean varieties yielded in the 40s? 16 bushel. Oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's it today? <laughs> it's 80. Yeah. We're in the same game, right? You know, yeah. you, everyone wants, well, you make that, they make that comparison. And uh, but but that's what I tell everyone. This is a long term investment. We still breed soybeans at the University of Minnesota from the 40s to now. Right. Mm -hmm. So as we look at this new set of crops, you know, where the first materials that are coming out are now commercial. We can make them financially viable, but that's not where you stop. <laughs> you know, you continue to to invest in the continued development of um, and enhancing the yields of these crops over time, just like any damn crop, right? So when the hybrid corn was developed, um, you know, the first hybrids yielded uh, about um, uh, 80, 80 bushel the acre, 60 to 80 bushel. What's it today? 280, right? Same, it's the same game, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so another question. Um, so you keep saying that, you know, trying to keep it from leaching out um, and everything. If fertilizer timing were different to just put it uh, when the, the corn beforehand um, was growing the most rapidly and only the amount that it needed, 
um, would it be such a problem? It certainly um, improves. It certainly improves. It. There's no question about it. But yeah. uh, but the problem is when you're farming uh, now thousands of acres, um, that that system does not allow for spoon feeding. Mm. Uh, but but still, you know, there needs to be a certain amount of nitrogen all along the way, and. Um, and you you know when the, the nitrogen is is being taken up, it's after the corn is moving beyond uh, that stage uh, that you have in the last week in in, in June. That's when you get the rapid growth, yeah. right? Uh, B6, uh, and yeah. if you could spoon spoon feed the appropriate amount as that plant develops, um, um, you could certainly improve it. That's yeah. absolutely no question about it. But this is what I would also say. Remember here in Minnesota in the Midwest, we also have mineralization. It's not just a fertilizer issue. As you till the soil, a lot of nitrogen is being, re is being released. That is also mobile. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have roots there, that, that uh, mineralized nitrogen is also going to leach. So it's not just the fertilizer. Right. Well, for one thing, um, how much is going no-till um, rather than tilling? Well, no-till, no you still have mineralization. Uh, you, know, you, you do. Maybe, it, you may reduce it to some degree, but you're still, you are still losing nitrogen yeah. in those systems. So, so, so in, uh, in my opinion, my humble opinion, the data that I know, uh, no-till may be improved, but it's not the solution. Hmm. So you don't think that better soil you aggregates have, and you don't have roots there that's using that water. If water is moving through that. Oh system, no, it, you have to have the cover crops in addition the to water no isn't till. moving. If water is moving through that system, you're moving nitrate, nitrate. Yeah. So I'm wondering though, um, for the cover crops, and I, I am yay, cover crops. Um but when you remove the harvest, when you harvest cover crops, um, aren't you removing some of those nutrients that you want for your next crop? Uh, maybe to some degree. Take, take uh, the, the system uh, with, um, uh, with uh, uh, pentacress or, 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 or camelina. Mm -hmm. You can't grow any dang crop without taking up nutrients, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In this case. Right. But those those crops are using residual nitrogen that isn't necessarily needed for the legume soybean, right? So if you're pulling nitrogen out from last fall. Uh, to uh, if you were on campus today, the, you know they're standing this high, and and remember the picture I showed you. Uh, we have bare soil next door to it. We've had a lot of rain. The nitrogen that was in that soil, <clears throat> where there's no crop, has been lost. I, so I'm comparing cover crop retaining, you know the what would be harvested versus cover crop, but harvesting it. Yeah, well, this is what I would say back to you. In Minnesota, cover crops don't work. Unless you move to what is called uh, planting green. And yeah. these cover crops that we have allow you to plant, allow you to plant, plant green, right? Yeah. So, so if you had uh, uh, winter rye uh, that is killed with Roundup, I'd have to go back and look at the data set in terms of how much of the nitrogen and nutrients that are in those standing plants actually get um, uh, moved into, into, the, into the, do you know, Nancy? Do you know that data set? No. Uh, um, I'd, have to, I'd have to go back and look, but most of the nitrogen that's in those stems that are standing up, I don't think ever gets into, into the soil. Where, where does it go? Atmosphere. Well, it has to get into the soil enough to. Well, 
be I, I, transformed <laughs> by the bacteria there. Well, yeah, there's bacteria on, on plants, right? Things deteriorate. It doesn't have to be in the soil to, to degrade. Yeah, it can degrade standing. Really? Nitrifying bacteria on the plants, huh? That's what I understand. We've okay. looked at a number of, of those, those systems in terms of residue, um, uh, looking at, well, but that was at, but that was, that was on the surface of soil, not in the soil, right? And there was a tremendous amount of, uh, of nitrogen, nitrogen loss. I'd have to go back and look at that data set. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, Ron is still with us. And then Lindsay, Ron had a question about some marketing opportunities. You can take yourself off mute. Yeah, I think you answered the question. Um, I do have another question about land grants. Um, and Lang, you make the picture of how great they are. I remember taking a graduate uh, weed science class and it was a horrible place. The smell in the room was baked bread all the time because you have to bake bread um, to see if the new varieties work. And that's how a land grant has all that stuff. It was a wonderful smell, but it shows you from all the degree that land grants can do. And I'll always remember that. How about tenure, um, promotion and tenure, and then other partnerships with other universities and land grants? Because the old, in the old days, we had varieties that we planted from Nebraska, Texas A&M, Minnesota, all over the place. That great effort with all those people. Is there, is it growing or is it just isolated in a couple spots? Well, remember, uh, I talked about all these crops that were developed and initiated by the land grant universities, but you know it's happened over time, right? Uh, you know, uh, I'll just give you an example of soybean. And before the release of Roundup Ready Genetics, uh, the, the soybean varieties that came out of the University of Minnesota covered 72% of the acreage in, in Minnesota. When Roundup Ready was introduced, and that trait was only released to other commercial companies and not to the, the public sector, uh, the public varieties went from 70%, as I stated, to zero, right? Uh, so this is, it's the same thing with, with hybrid corn. As soon as hybrid corn was developed and the industry picked up their own um, uh, inbred lines, uh, the university uh, basically went out of the, uh, the commercial uh, corn breeding programs. The only one that's left is wheat because the industry um, has not made huge investments. I didn't say it was zero, but haven't made huge investments to capture that market because they don't have the ability to do it. And that's why they're focusing on hybrid wheat. You can develop hybrid wheat that would allow them to capture that market and maintain control of the wheat germplasm, but that hasn't worked out yet, right? So we still have a wheat breeding program uh, that uh, releases varieties, and that material is shared uh, through, uh, uh, through the experiment stations uh, uh, and, 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 and through, that, through, through that network. When it comes to these new crops that we're developing here, uh, we are developing a system for uh, evaluation of this germplasm uh, across, uh, across the region, but the universities have learned their lesson. You know, uh, when the land grants and the, and the experiment stations were funded at a very high level by the state and federal resources, we basically gave that germplasm away or the universities gave that germplasm away that was picked up and used by others with no return back to those breeding programs. And if you look at the corn varieties, the hybrids that are out there in the northern region of the United States, you can track 35% of the genes that are in the current line sold by Bayer and on and on. 
to farmers today, you can track them back to the St. Paul campus, right? And the taxpayers have received basically no direct return on that investment in that germplasm, all right? And at that time, that was the way it was. And that was the model that was in place. But today, you know, with the public investment and the development of these new crops that we're talking about, uh, I'm making sure that the taxpayers of the state get some return on the investment they're making in this in the, in this in this program. Yeah, that's a it's a change because it used to be thought of as a public good. That it was the public investments good. it was a public good because the public was supporting it. Yes, and that return was higher yields, better food production, etc. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So, so, you know, we're still a land grant. We still have that philosophy. But for example, I'll just give you my example, my success story. I, re I released perennial ryegrass lines, turf types to the farmers in Rosso. I helped them organize a co-op. Out of my program, we released my new varieties to that co-op. Uh, they basically grow it, process it, and market to the world. And the University of Minnesota gets 3% of the wholesale value of that, of that product. So I'm very interested in thinking that through as we work with these new co-ops that are developing around Kernza, uh, that they have value. There's value back to the research program. There's value through all the way up to, to General Mills. So that's you, the model that we look at. Do you have a licensing program, like an open source licensing program or anything we like have, that? We have licensing pro, program, yes. Okay. For example, Covercress, right? Maybe you guys have heard about Covercress. They're the first to commercialize Pentacress, but most of the genes in that germplasm, the, 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 the domestication traits came from the Forever Green Initiative. So they're out on contract with them and there'll be royalty returns based on the traits that are used in that germplasm. And that was the other big deal. I don't know if you guys have followed this, but the first production of uh, Pentacrest is going to be in the southern part of the Midwest. Uh, it's going to be handled uh, through Covercrest, Bungie, and Mobile. So there, just a few weeks ago, I can send it if you guys are interested, that there was a big news release that uh, there'll be major production of Pentacrest in the southern part of the United States. That Pentacrest seed uh, will be managed by Bungie and marketed directly to mobile for the production of jet fuel, right? So that's an example of starting with <laughs> sequencing the genome, domesticating Pentacrest, the all ones, bam, it's gonna be in jet fuel, right? All right, Lindsay, you, you have a couple of questions if you can <clears throat> ask one or both, and then we'll go to Paul. Hi, I'm, I'm in Ohio, and I'm wondering if small property owners could, for example, plant the Kernza as a way to protect water wells, local water wells. Could there be some kind of a program through extension to do that sort of thing with no thought of trying to harvest? Well, I mean, in that case, there'd be a lot of options, right? There would be a lot of options in terms of native grasses that are native. What, what area of Ohio are you in? Uh, Central Ohio, but north of Columbus, it's flat here, low, yeah. high water table. Yeah, our, our, I manage the family farms. Do you, do you know Wasion? That, that's north of us. That's our Defiance, that area. That's, that's where our family farms were at. That's, that's where I grew up. Right. So, so to answer your question uh, directly, when it comes to Kernza, we are interested in getting a commercial pull. Um, and there, there may be other native grasses that would, would be as efficient or even better, but, but certainly Kernza uh, would do just fine. It would, it would have long-term persistence in a system like that. But but just to be straightforward, we're trying to get the majority of the seed that we have um, uh, placed in commercial production uh, uh, for grazing and for, 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 for seed. But 
you could contact the Albert Lee Seed House in Albert Lee, Minnesota. They are the ones that are commercially producing mm. Minnesota Clearwater. And uh, you might very well be able to, to get a supply from, uh, from, from them. Thank for you. That, for, that, for that purpose. It's, it's the Albert Lee Seed House in Albert Lee, Minnesota. Very reliable group. So they, they are our partners in Minnesota. We have another partner in Wisconsin that are actually producing the Kernza for sowing purposes, right? The seed that's actually going to the farmers. Paul. Th thanks, Greg. Uh, I was just actually going to ask, Sarah uh, had asked a question earlier, and, and that was, what is the effect of these crops on microrhizobial fungi, nitrogen fixing bacteria, and other beneficial wow. microbes? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm uh, not the right guy to ask, but it's being done, right? So we have Jessica Gutnick. Uh, she is the lead scientist that's uh, working on um, uh, soil health, looking at the microbial associations, and uh, it's starting with Kernza, but we're also um, moving and getting the resources to invest in understanding um, uh, these other uh, cropping systems as, as well. And if you send me an email, I will send, well, talk to her, and I will send you a summary of what they have. Um, I'm not sure at this stage whether that long-term work has been published yet, but rest assured that stuff is going on, right? Looking at the microbial associations, carbon sequestration, greenhouse gas exchange, all of, um, all of those, uh, those issues are being investigated by that team. Great, thank you. Yeah. And you guys know that's expensive stuff, right? Everything we were talking about across this full array, that's my responsibility. It's moving adequate resources to those teams to answer, answer those questions. And the teams are now well organized and they've been very successful in bringing in major federal, um, uh, federal grants. Four of the teams have been funded at 10 million each off of federal resources. So there's science, that they're proposing is 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 actually being funded. So, yeah. and Paul, are 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 you wanting to ask your second question about crop res residue or not, or is that a, a comment in the chat? He's on mute. If you're talking, Paul. All right. Well, we've gotten through the bulk of the questions here, so I guess I would pause and see if there's any last question for the group. And I'm and I'm looking at Nancy on my screen as our leader, who, who, who had multiple questions here. Oh, I asked them. Okay, good. <laughs> the only one, the only one that the old guy couldn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> but Nancy, Nancy, I'd be happy to to follow up with the folks that really know this stuff. And oh, that would be wonderful. These Thank are you. things that they're actually. If you send me a, an email, I'd, I'd I would be happy to get you um, the real science from the real scientists that are working. Oh, wonderful. On. Right. I appreciate that. Yeah. And then maybe just a couple of people had dropped off. One person asked, "Is there any chance of these turning in in uh, invasive when they're released?" Say that again. Is there any chance that these crops you're developing could turn into an invasive species? Well, we evaluate that, right? You know, you take pentacrest. That's one of the big battles we had right up front. Uh, the idea that we are going to put in the, what's in the mind of many people, a weedy species on more acres. But then having to go through and explain to folks that, <coughs> and, that we are domesticating it so it isn't a damn weed, right? And, and show them the studies that we're doing to show that uh, the, you know, for, for, for pentacrest, you know, the seed is normally 
uh, brown, and we are selecting for the yellow seed that's non, not dormant, uh, so it doesn't carry over from one season to the next. It will never be zero non-carryover because rapeseed and camelina, canola, and all of those hard seeded uh, uh, oil seeds, they do carry over. So there, there's always going to be a weedy component, right, to it, right? But pennycress um, uh, is, has been on the landscape for, you know, probably 200 damn years. And it's not considered to be a weedy problem in most systems. However, um, uh, it is of concern to dairy farmers, right? or off flavor milk and those types of things, right? But we're breeding out glucosinolates that give it the off flavor. So uh, we have to go through and explain that. And, and what I'd like to say to everyone, you know, we, we, we are uh, paying great attention um, uh, to that to, in terms of the weediness and basicness. But on the other hand, you see, you know, uh, most of these plants are native things that have been introduced, but they've also been introduced, um, you know, 100 years ago, right? If they were going to be invasive in the work that we're doing as we're, we're domesticating them would make them even less invasive, right? And Daniel, I think you'll have the honor of our final question here. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, uh, one thing I was wondering about uh, the keeping the the root in the soil um, as a way of, of controlling runoff and um, it, it seems like that that's something that's very important um, even almost more important in hotter uh, climates and I one thing I was wondering is that since you're focused here in Minnesota is there um, how, how how well will these crops translate to warmer climates um, and is there or is there any program uh, that is being conducted in other areas that will allow people in that, that are trying to gr uh, raise crops in hotter areas yeah. to actually keep the the, so the the root in the soil all the time? We don't have any work in the tropics but we do have uh, work in China, India, um, Brazil, uh, so we have partners uh, with academic institutions, you know, in various regions of the world, but not a lot of work in the tropics because, you know, we, we, we are trying to solve the problem in the upper, upper Midwest, right? You know, from central Midwest north. And it's in those regions of the Midwest where cover crops, classical ones, have no value, right? So if you have rye, for example, that you've seeded in the fall in Minnesota, you might uh, get uh, 50 pounds of biomass in the fall. And then uh, uh, in, the, in the spring, in a year like this, uh, you, you might get a few hundred pounds of biomass. But by the time the farmer is ready to plant corn, that's about the second week in April in most years, third week in, in April, you just don't have any biomass. Mm -hmm. Unless, Nancy, as you think about planting green, right? Letting those cover crops grow for a longer period of time and then uh, planting in almost some type of a relay crop system, right? But that's, but that's what we're trying to do. You know, but the picture is still in front of you guys. That is, that is a classical, for me, plant green system uh, that, that, that is different than, than uh, winter rye because it produces e economic return. But then the questions that Nancy asked, well, yeah, but uh, how much nutrients are you taking, taking off? Well, uh, you're taking some off, you know, you're, you're producing grain, right? And uh, how much of the nitrogen is that system that, as it, lays on the surface of the soil, how much of that nitrogen is being lost and not incorporated in the system. And just to say back again, those are the concrete studies that we're doing, so we know. Right. Uh, and, and I'm not presenting to you that these systems are perfect, but I think they're better than what we have. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, uh, uh, one thing I just uh, actually even just to suggest is that um, so, sometimes people, when they're when they're looking for these so at these solutions, it's like, well, this is something that needs to go to another to other places. 
um, if you could actually even um, try and try and uh, um, um, put it in your slides when you produce presentations, hey, this is this is a, something that's climatically relevant. You know, we can't do some of these things that, you know, that, we, that are, will work in other places. And, you know, so people get an idea of the parameters of where the uh, of where they say, do these systems start to work? And maybe that'll give uh, people ideas for, you know, if, if they're if they're from another place. Well, I need to do something slightly differently. It's, it's well, not slightly different. Pick another damn plant. Right. So right. so we're picking the plants that fit the upper Midwest. Okay. We yeah. also write in our in our work that's published in science and other places, uh, the philosophy behind it, right? So if you're in a region of, uh, of Brazil, uh, uh, where there's other cover crops, other systems that, that could be employed using something other than Camelina pentacress, um, uh, develop a program that advances those, those, those opportunities. So those are the arguments that we make, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's it's really great to hear that. Um, I know that we that we, um, here in 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 the Western Nebraska, we the, the our local program um, that it, in terms of cover crops, they've discovered that a lot of things that work other places just don't work here. You have to do. Oh, well, absolutely, and, and we would never yeah. say that, right? I mean, that's it, it has to be new crop, new cover crops, new systems that fit your environment, right? Mm -hmm. So the other product that we produced, so your, your uh, new wheat breeder in Nebraska is also a product of this initiative. Dr. Frells is, uh, is uh, a postdoc that uh, did a lot of the early work on the domestication of pentacrest. She's now the wheat breeder in Nebraska. <laughs> is uh, that at the U University yeah, of Nebraska? Yeah, yeah, University of Nebraska, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, another example of a product from the program. <laughs> well, and Dr. Wise, I'll, 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 I'll end here. How is your funding discussion going with our state legislature well, here? You know, it, you know, it's always uh, difficult. Have you guys heard of politics? <laughs> uh, so you guys know it's, it's, uh, uh, this is what I would say back to you. We have support for this program on both sides of the aisle, strong support. Um, but you know, the debate is over how much goes here, how much it goes there. Uh, we are, are in the uh, uh, appropriate bill, omnibus bill in both the House and the Senate. It's now going into conference. So we, um, any, any comments that you guys could make on, on to uh, to these legis legislators as they as they go into conference would be greatly appreciated in terms of telling them to uh, provide uh, support for this work. Uh, it would be greatly appreciated. And I we had done that pre previously. If there's something specific or a guide on how to, we're certainly willing to activate that. And well, I can here. I can have our our NGOs. I don't do that work. I can't do it as a land grant scientist, uh, but I can certainly, if you send me an email, I will put you in contact with our lobbying group. Great. And they, they can tell you what to do or what would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, Dr. Wise, thank you so much for this long discussion. You you had obviously cap, captivated this group with the discussion here. Well, we're wide open. You know, we believe in this work. You know, we've been doing it for years. We have 55 people here at the University of Minnesota working on these on these projects. Uh, we are we are reasonably well funded. Uh, what I told you in terms of the teams in place uh, that is true. Uh, we have the best scientists at the University of Minnesota, from basic genomics to food science, the Carlson School of Management. Uh, working on this, my my problem is making sure that once you bring that high quality group of people together, I can keep them in place. So that's what I fight the battle is making sure that there's adequate resources for them to function, and they can then also then go off and bring in substantial ad additional uh, additional funds. So just for you guys, for an example, just to give you an idea, 
the state of Minnesota puts in uh, about a million and a half, two millions a year into this program. And uh, the teams over the last three years brought in an additional 80 million. Oh. You know, from foundations, federal government, rich people. So, so they, these teams are, are, are not, are, uh, are doing really well because the folks of the world are now beginning to believe that what we're producing is real. It's no longer just an idea. We actually have the damn plants in the field. We actually have cereal in a box and people are eating the, the materials coming out of the program. And that makes a huge, huge difference when it becomes real. Yeah. Well, and Nancy, just to say back to you that, you know, the, the, your area of interest, that is the weakest area for us. We're robust, but it's the weakest because it's expensive and no one wants to invest directly into that. That is, that is a really difficult area. And once you get products in the market, you know what people want to do. They want to invest in the commercialization. And they don't want to invest in that continued development of the, and the assessment of ecosystem services. That's, that's a real, real challenge. Not sexy. Not, not, <laughs> Well, for some of us, it really is. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. The question that you're asking, the that you're Those asking, with the money. <laughs> no one wants to, that's exactly right. You know, for us as scientists, those are the, the interesting questions, right? In yeah. terms of the dynamics of these systems. But, yeah. but uh, when it comes to funders, uh, there's only a select number that really when it comes to state government, you know, that's the last damn thing they want to invest in. <laughs> they just want you to go out and plant something and clean up the damn water, right? Yeah. All right. Strong sport. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks for Thanks so much. Stay in touch. You bet. I will follow, follow up with, with you about both the lobbying and getting a copy of the... All right.